So yeah, welcome to our viewers. We are Fran and Darren from Wild Pulse, and today we talk to Felix, who is in charge of the fermentation lab of uh, the restaurant Lokavor in Bali, Indonesia. Hello, Felix. Hello. Thank you very much for taking part in this. Yeah, I'm looking forward. Thank you. If you could maybe give us an idea of the the values or the concept of, of Lokavor. So yeah, the, the values are uh, local, like, like, like the name uh, uh, says already. Um, so local ingredients, uh, um, also from Bali, but also Indonesia, so we don't limit ourselves too much. Um, we have a big um, focus on sustainability as well, So we're trying our best. We're not claiming to be, be anything zero waste or whatever, but we, 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 trying, we try our best uh, to keep it sustainable. And also, yeah, um, making the, the food. I mean, we have a, uh, Indonesia is a, one of the biggest biodiversity on the planet. So to make these ingredients, which are common here, more interesting to, to the people who come to the restaurant. So, and it's not authentic Indonesian uh, food or Balinese food. It is like modern cuisine, but using the ingredients from here and make it a bit more uh, accessible to, to guests of our restaurant. Um, the restaurant is quite casual, but we have a multi-course uh, menu. Like at the moment, we have one menu uh, with a vegetarian option. So you can have actually two menus, but we only advertise one menu. And yeah, so it's, it's also about... Uh, I think a lot, uh, for me, like I, I worked here five years, a lot is about changing as well. So it's like not keep, keep signature dishes. We, we do change a lot. We change mm -hmm. the menus a lot. And we almost never do a dish two times. So it's just, uh, keep moving, keep innovating, and uh, keep pushing towards uh, new, new, new frontiers, really. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Brilliant. Um, and then local local lab. Can you tell us a bit about that? This is your R and D space, that's right? Or yeah, it's an R and D space. Uh, we have a table in there, so sometimes we have a private diner or events in there, or like staff training as well. Uh, we have a little book library. Um, I call it a bit like it's it's a bit both. It's a test kitchen and fermentation lab. Mm -hmm. So we combine combining that, and uh, I'm usually in there. Uh, full time myself was one before before uh, the pandemic. There was uh, two people at the moment. It's just one person with me, and so I, I usually explain it like this. So there's one focus is creating um, new menus. So it's like recipe development and uh, menu development, mm -hmm. and then the other aspect is creating like a flavor. Um, how do you call it, like a flavor library okay, yeah. of local ingredients. So we have it available also for the testing. Um, so if I need a certain flavor, I have it already available. So I work a lot with fermentation and pretty much focusing on umami flavors, or savory flavors, and also acidic flavors. So, and so it's, it's kind of both. It's a bit test kitchen, but it's also fermentation lab as well. Mm. Okay. Awesome. So, um, question about fermentation at your restaurant. Um, fermentation is getting more and more popular in gastronomy. What does fermentation mean for your restaurant and why do you ferment? So, yeah, I mean, it, from, for the restaurant, it means uh, flavor, first of all. And also it means preserving ingredients which are maybe have only short season and making them accessible for a longer time. So fermentation could be like a salting or a drying or a curing or a fermenting in a miso. So we have, we have the flavor available for longer. And also uh, it means finding new flavors. So finding the have, because you have a certain uh, amount of ingredients here, which is a lot, 
but we're trying to unlock the flavor through so fermentation. So it's, it's basically um, for flavor, deliciousness, and uh, preserve, preservation for the restaurant as well. Yeah. When you're in the, the lab, like how much of it is uh, focused on production? How much is on uh, trials? Or do you, do you, do, how do you organize yourself in that sense? So yeah, I, I mainly uh, focus on trials. Okay. So and and uh, recipe menu development, mm -hmm. which at the moment we change uh, three to four times a year the whole menu, and the production we do partly of it when we decide on the menu, like we decide on the whole new menu, and mm -hmm. we have a few fermented uh, items on there. Uh, at the moment, this is quite a lot. Then we do the initial production until we uh, we train the staff. In the, in the main kitchen and we, we hand over the menu and then I also hand over the fermentation. We have mm -hmm. uh, one person in, in charge there to, to do the production. Okay. But uh, we, in the beginning I have to coordinate, um, but uh, basically we do a lot of small trials. So I'm, I'm, I'm not really doing uh, massive amounts. Okay. I don't have the space, space for it. Uh, it's just small experiments. And then if they go on the menu, which might be just a 10% or 20% goes on the menu and then we start producing it and then hand it yeah, over okay. to you. Oh, wow. Amazing. Um, and then how do, you, how do you stay on top of your schedules and your timings for fermentation? Do you, use, do you have a diary or is it like noted or computed? Or? So, yeah, it, it starts with the menu and then whatever, you, whatever we use in the menu, mm -hmm. Then after afterwards, uh, we have we're making a schedule like uh, like to to um, yeah to to kind of coordinate the production of it. Like uh, so, when when we have the menu, we have like a mise en place and the recipes and all the ingredients we need. But also we have a fermentation schedule as well. Yeah. Okay. So. And then, uh, what, so that's kind of like separate what, what fermentation we have in the menu. And uh, dairy, uh, I don't really have, um, but I, I have like an inventory. I do an inventory regularly to keep on, on track of, um, I mean, I have literally, I don't know, thousands and thousands of experiments, which is a bit hard to get them all in your head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this uh, last picker you did two years ago, uh, so it's, it, it it helps to have inventory for for the overview. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I can imagine. Yeah, um, yeah it's not, I mean, it sounds super it's super interesting. What about um, in in regard of uh, like food safety and fermenting in a Balinese climate? Do you notice more challenges there with it being you know more humid, more hot, and how do you and do you ha how do you handle things in terms of food safety? So yeah, we're in the lab, uh, it's air conditioned. So I keep the temperature around 25 degrees or okay. like it's pretty stable temperature. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, the problematic uh, part is usually when it comes to the main kitchen because mm -hmm. it's uh, much more hotter. So and if you have something lacto-fermented and you do it at, I mean, even, even the... the the outside temperature might be 25, but then in the kitchen it's like 35 or 40 degrees. So the lack of fermented things just go very funky very fast. Yeah. Um, so we, we set up a little office space, a separate office space where we um, keep our ferments and that's also air conditioned. Um, <laughs> of course, a lot of, a lot of uh, the lack of ferment, I like to keep a bit lower temperature but some of the like ketchup manis and some of the things or garums, which mm -hmm. they, they can take uh, 30 degrees or uh, some humidity and, and heat. So that's, that's quite good. Sure. Um, in terms of hygiene, I just, uh, I mean, food safety, I just sterilize everything like uh, boiling hot water and, uh, just keep really things clean. And I, I found the most important thing is 
the sterilization and then just really how you pack your jars. I think there's there's not really much danger if you do the, mm-hmm. the te- mm-hmm. technique properly. Uh, because often people have that question, how about, you know, the uh, health. Um, but I, I didn't really find much problems because you're also using your senses in your smell and your taste. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if some, something doesn't smell good and doesn't look good, you yeah you have to toss yeah. it away. Sure. So the common sense also. Well, exactly. Yeah. But of course, uh, working clean is important. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so we're slowly moving towards the ferments, for which I took some pictures from Instagram. Mm. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. So where on the spectrum are you in terms of traditional Indonesian ferments versus traditional European ferments and new interpretations? Uh, this, this is a picture of your lab, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, we, they, I, I don't really have any boundaries. It, it's like everything is allowed. Um, because it's not authentic uh, Indonesian food we do in the restaurant and it's not authentic Balinese. So I basically base everything on the ingredients and then the technique we use can come from anywhere. So I don't really, I don't limit myself on the technique. Of course, Indonesia has a lot of interesting ferments, uh, which we explore also, like, uh, they call it tape and uh, which is like, like a, fermented rice and uh, fermented cassava uh, and then also they have a, like a, a brim which is like a rice wine mm-hmm. so and then of course a tempeh and ketchup manis and so we, we do them as well but sometimes I also try to do them uh, in a different way yeah so not the authentic way because I often I feel that the authentic way is better done by people who have done it for hundreds and hundreds of years they do better ketchup money than possibly we can uh, sure. we can do. Mm. Yeah. And um, so it's it's of course we have a lot of fruits. So I, I, I make a lot of uh, in the back you can see there's a lot of uh, the bottles are a lot of fruit vinegars. Um, we make a lot of misos and I also use a lot of um, uh, kombucha of course but I also use a lot of uh, 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 koji and especially shio koji in, in many different ways. Okay. Yeah. So, but also, yeah. Yeah, I use the tempeh culture also to do different things with, like uh, they call it tempeh ragi. Uh, so I'm using it as a kind of uh, to break down enzymes, because it has enzymes which break down protein, so I use it to make miso, and you can kind of use it as a koji as well. Um, so like a koji tan. So you can use a tempeh ragi in a, in a similar way. Mm-hmm. And also yeah. you can use the tape uh, culture, which is like a yeast culture, in a similar way to koji as well. So, um, yeah. So we integrate, we integrate um, Indonesian technique using local ingredients but also from all over the world yeah yeah Yeah, we're gonna talk about a few of those ferments um in a moment um to start with i would like to show this um image from instagram and i'll read what you wrote about it um lacto vegetable demi-glace this is a short story and great example of how we approach our kitchen byproducts these days we collect all vegetable peels, trimming and herb stems. Next, we lacto-ferment them for seven to 10 days. Then we dehydrate them until fully crisp, fully crisp and dry. Last step is that we make an intense stock out of it, strain it, reduce it until it has a nice strong flavor and a vicious texture. I think this is a really great way to dive deeper into your ferments and how you upcycle byproducts in an efficient, um, tasty way. So is there any other things you do with um, scraps, food scraps that you upcycle with fermentation? Yeah, I've, for me, this is one of the best examples uh, you, you showed there. 
Um, yeah, we do uh, use coffee grounds to make miso and uh, coffee shoyu and coffee kombucha and also like a candied uh, praline like uh, from the coffee grounds. Mm. Using that to make like a palm sugar praline. Um, I'm also like all the most of the herb stems, I like to ferment them and uh, grind them up into dry them, grind them up into powder. Because I found the lack of fermentation really enhances the flavor. Mm -hmm. uh, while when you're just drying herbs and then grind them up, they just taste a bit like hay, mm -hmm. like like yeah. grass. Like grass. Um, so yeah, I mean it. It goes like uh, like the fermented shallot powder, like the fermented, and you can use the skins from the uh, the outer skin from the shallot and from garlic. Um, I also make something with spices. So I can um, combine all the different alliums, shallot, garlic, and um, spring onion uh, with chili, uh, coriander seeds, and some other spices, and then lacto-ferment it, and then dry it and use it as a seasoning. Yeah. So, so yeah, powders, lacto-fermented powders are a big uh, way to use um, leftovers, and then fruits. Uh, Either way, going to vinegar or going to kombucha. Some overripe fruits can be blackened as well. And uh, bread, uh, like sourdough bread or leftover bread, we make into miso or into like a amino sauce. And um, what else I can think of? So vegetable skins, like this demi glass you see there. Um, so this. It's, I try to not uh, also, we do a lot of experimentation, but then to apply it to the restaurant, I try to really streamline it and make it very practical. Yeah. So that they don't have like 20 projects going on. So I try to combine all the vegetable peels uh, to make this demi glass and then put that on the menu so they have to actually produce it. So, yeah. I think it's, it's like an endless topic, really, the upcycling. But um, for me, fermentation plays a major role in it. Like also like uh, fish bones and fish innards. And um, we, we turn into uh, garum, uh, kind of like a soy sauce made with koji and salt. And also leftover meat, we also turn into uh, uh, garums. And uh, so it's, it's like an endless uh, project, but it it is really um, fermentation is really key in in doing it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. No, yes, yeah, really interesting. I, I, I love the idea of the lacto fermented uh, demi glass. Really well. Yeah, yeah, you should. Uh, I mean, you should try it. It's, it's actually mm. really so flavorful it, mm. that like like um, my my uh, bosses. Um, the owners of the restaurants are both really like uh, carnivore and they, they tasted in the first time and they said like, wow, this is like a demi glass. Huh? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> it doesn't have any meat in it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. The misos look really uh, amazing. You know, I, we've, I'm experimenting with that at the moment. Um, so here we've got uh, the egg fruit miso, uh, blackened mm -hmm. alliums, miso, black garlic, black shallots, black leeks, and then uh, uh, katsu bushi, the bonito yeah. flake, if I'm saying that yeah. right. So katsu you, bushi. katsu bushi, yeah. So you experiment with many different types of miso pastes. The idea is you just kind of, again, looking at Indonesian ingredients, Balinese ingredients, and uh, could, would you be able to give any advice to any? chefs or restaurants that want to start making their own misos as well yeah i mean I, I think basically you have to look at what what is most abundantly available in your surrounding and has a good amount of protein in it um so you don't really maybe want to like if you're doing a miso from higher oil seeds like hazelnuts for example it's possible but you don't want to ferment it too long uh, because it can go quite rancid. It has protein, but so for, for like nut measles, I would more use uh, 
uh, defected uh, pulp from nuts, which you can get from an uh, oil mill, like the walnut uh, flour, they call it, or hazelnut flour, which is like defected, mm -hmm. which is perfect for miso and it's also quite cheap. Um, so you, you look at the proteins around you, um, which can be legumes, uh, lentils, nuts and seeds, and then you can turn it in, into miso with the addition of, of a koji and salt. Um, but also, you can also use vegetables and fruits, uh, for example, beetroot. Uh, you can do beetroot miso, carrot miso. They usually um, become a bit more sweet. And sometimes if they're fermented too long, they have an alcoholic tendency to have a, some alcohol, alcohol content. Um, but also you can also use animal protein, cooked animal protein, which was for me an eye-opener as well. As much as it's uh, low fat, so you don't want to really like have the, the fat from the beef because that really turns rancid or like if you're using insects, which are really high in fat, some of them okay. uh, make, makes your miso rancid. So you can use uh, seafoods like uh, shrimps or lobster or, or things like this, but usually in a cook, cooked way. Um, and then also, of course, alliums, which are also um, high in protein as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's basically there's no limit to it, um, to mesos. I mean, I don't really call them really... I, I, I still call them miso, but it's like really not, not authentic. I mean... Um, you can look in actually the book of Miso, it's an old, old, uh, original book of, um, uh, uh, have it, I think it's William, uh, Shurtleff. yeah, yeah, and, yeah, Shurtleff, and yeah, William like, Shurtleff, yeah, and they, they even back then they already had like a sweet potato miso in Japan mm. and like a fruit miso, and so there, there's a lot of possibilities. But to answer your questions, I always would think what is locally available, what's high protein content, and also you can look for byproducts as well. Mm. Like the, mm. the nut, nut pulp or you have a, if you're making a, um, plant based milk, you have a lot of pulp or you make an almond milk, you have a lot of pulp. That all can go into miso. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you can use it as a base really. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Shiokochi, you have some really interesting shiokochis going on as well. Can you tell us about your various kinds of shiokochi and what you use it for? Yeah, so, so shiokochi, I, I, um, I'm a big fan of. For me, that um, the original shiokochi, just salt, koji and water, uh, it's kind of like a main staple seasoning I use because I, I found it improves pretty much everything. Uh, so instead of salt, just use chiyokoji and everything uh, gets this touch of umami as well. But then uh, further on, we start playing around with different bumbus, which are like local spice paste, uh, usually like, uh, yeah, like, like in, in Bali and in Indonesia, we have spice paste like in, in, in Thailand. They have like a green curry, red curry, yellow curry. So the same here we have for different curries, we have different spice paste. Okay. And I use that uh, in combination with salt and koji and raw, not cooked actually, the spices. Uh, just blend it up and it was just such an eye-opener. And I must say this is like a... For me, one of these very unique local lab products, like, yeah. which I haven't seen anywhere else. I mean, I, I see some people doing garlic shiokuji and chili shiokuji, but using the local spices in combination, in traditional combination, but then combine them in a shiokuji, uh, which completely transforms uh, the bitterness of the spices. And it just is pure umami. You nice. basically... You're bringing out all the umami from all the different spices, and it it's like an instant. You can add it to anything really, from emulsions, marinades to sauces, yeah. and marinating fish and meat and vegetables, and it's just uh, very incredible. So shiokuji is 
uh, also very practical in our kitchen because it just takes uh, 10 days to make. Yeah. And it has flavors. Or like when, yeah. I, when I make a meat dough and it takes six months to two years, it's sometimes very difficult to put it on the menu. Uh, it needs a lot of yeah. planning. But the chio koji can be just instantly and in, uh, like in, in two yeah. weeks. Yeah. So we use it a lot as a seasoning. Um, yeah, for anything from soap and marinades and dressings and yeah. Amazing. I mean, this picture alone makes me want to fly over to Bali and yeah. try it. It just looks so it tempting. Also, <laughs> it also breaks down the protein as well if you marinate. Yeah, uh, exactly. Chicken. Yeah chicken or fish or anything yeah. which makes it more tender. So as someone living in Europe, I'm quite obsessed with wild yeast, especially in, in spring. I, I do so many experiments with wild yeast. So of course I had to take this picture of your Instagram account of a meat with wild black honey, fresh jackfruit and dry pineapple. So my question is, do you often work with wild yeast and what do you do with it? Yeah, we, we do. Um, so me, this meat is, of course, an example uh, because any we have a lot of fruits. So we have a lot of uh, the the yeast on the fruits in the in the fruits, and also we have access to fresh coconut nectar from the flower of the coconut tree, mm. and um, they call it uh, nera in here, and also palm nectar which both of them are used to make palm uh, sugar and coconut sugar as well. And we also have fresh sugar cane. And so I use these, um, these, in um, these three liquids as a base to make vinegars as well. Yeah. Because they are so active and so high in sugar and also uh, wild yeast. So they have, when we, when we get it in a, and the bottle, the bottle is usually already overflowing because mm -hmm. it's so And the coconut uh, nectar, for example. Amazing. And then, then I use it as a starter without any additional sugar. I use it as a starter to make a fruit vinegar. All oh, right. Okay. Which is quite, quite a unique uh, technique we, we developed here. Um, also palm nectar as well. So I'm, I'm adding certain whatever fruit I want and then combining it with uh, one of these three ingredients, sugar cane juice as well, fresh, and it makes fantastic vinegar. So, so it's, uh, that's, that's purely run on wild yeah. yeast. And then stirring action for the one first week, I stir it every day to keep the yeast active and then strain it off the pulp. Yeah. Okay. And then also honey as well. Yeah. Amazing. So another liquid, kombucha, which is also gaining more and more um, popularity in gastronomy. So I took a picture from your Instagram from a durian kombucha from the leftover durian seeds. Mm -hmm. Um, with some meat attached to it and the black sesame kombucha. Mm. So how do you use kombucha in the restaurant? Uh, we, we have a cocktail pairing. Okay. So we often use it as a cocktail uh, pairing. Um, and also I use it as uh, often I ferment it quite far so it gets more on the acidic yeah. phase, more like vinegar-like. So for me, it's a very easy way to make uh, use up leftover and to make it into vinegar as well. Yeah. Uh, um, so sometimes, because it usually always works if you do the follow the, the normal guidelines. And also we, we reduce it as well to get syrup. Yeah. Like, uh, okay. um, uh, and then we use the syrup to glaze something. Right. So it has... It has um, yeah, several applications yeah. for beverage in the in the restaurant, but also in the kitchen as a pickling liquid or yeah, as a yeah, cooking exactly. liquid. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's it's just so perfect to use leftovers. Yeah. In uh, yeah, it's it's one of the easiest way to make it something. Just adding sugar, uh, water, and then 
scooby and some kombucha yeah, exactly, and you yeah. can use any kind of leftovers in it yeah and as you say in astronomy it's so versatile you can drink it you can cook with it um yeah kombucha is really amazing yeah even even you have the fruit fruit and uh vegetable kombucha as well so yeah. you can use uh like chilies and green tomatoes and cucumbers and, and all these things as well. So it it's, um, gives a lot of possibilities yeah. for sure. Yeah, for sure, yeah. So we're moving on to the last drink, Amasake. I read from your Instagram, after our first successful Bram Amasake kombucha experiment, the next logical step was to add another layer of tropical fruit flavor. So we omitted the water and used ripe jackfruit and salak puree, which we ferment with kombucha and scoby and bram amasake. So I would like to focus on the amasake bit. So you mm. obviously you've been experimenting with amasake. What have you learned and how do you use amasake in the restaurant these days? So yeah, I make we, we make the traditional one, which is just um, koji. Uh, rice koji and then uh, cooked grain and then I use it uh, for several like pickles we make a different pickles sometimes um, also marinade as a marinade um, also for uh, ice cream as a sweetener sometimes um, but I even found out uh, just recently a better way um, not better but a different way um, to use a local culture which is called tape brim um, which you basically cook the rice and add this uh, powdered starter to it and then you you don't even have to keep the heat um, so you just leave it outside the room temperature and it becomes very sweet because it's mainly amylas in the I, I assume it's mainly amylas uh, enzyme yeah. if um, so you have a instantly after one or two days you have like a amasake which is very sweet and but it's made from brem so it's using yeah. the local culture okay and using any kind of grain or starch like cassava or sweet potato or uh, uh, banana and then you can turn it into like a amasake style. But uh, so th that's why I, I uh, wrote down uh, then the description. It's like a brem amasake. So yeah. using that. Uh, okay. So like the, in, in, in Japanese traditional, they have two kinds of amasake. One is just using koji, cooked rice, and then holding it at 60 degrees until it's sweet. Um, and then the other one uses uh, sake kasu, yeah. The leftover from sake, and then combining it with uh, rice, and then I think some sugar as well. So and that's that's another kind of amasake. And our brem, which is like a rice wine, that's very similar to mm -hmm. Japanese sake. Yeah. So we have this uh, clear liquid, which is a brem, and then uh, the pulp is um, is a tape. So it's like like a sake. Yeah. Uh, as Kasu, yeah, but it's just a different culture and just a different yeah. name, really. But uh, yeah, we, I, I try to make, try to make use of this leftover as well, the, the yeah. pipe from, from making rice wine. Hiccup manis, which is a sweetened aromatic soy sauce um, and an essential condiment in Indonesia. Can you? I'm always interested in in local local fermented products. So, can you tell us about other um, Indonesian fermented condiments? So, yeah, I mean the the main one is I think the most popular is ketchup manis. Then they have um, ketchup asin, which is like a salty soy sauce, which is actually the same product um, but without palm sugar. And so all, all of them traditionally use black soybean. Um, you can also make uh, with white soybean, but usually they use black soybean. And then they also have something called taucho, which is like Indonesian miso. 
um, which I think usually uses white soybean and it has like the, the beans inside as well. Yeah. But it's also sweetened with palm sugar. Um, so that's called taucho and then they have a dry taucho as well. And then they have a smoked taucho. Um, so all this is on based on, on soybeans. And most of them actually came over from China and uh, Japan, I think, yeah. as well. And uh, Korea. So yeah. it's kind of, they, they just made it their own version, really. Yeah. <laughs> to, to, um, to catch up money is really quite, quite popular here. Yeah. Um, as a condiment, of course, we have a lot of sambals. Some of them are also fermented. Like uh, they have like a sambal tempoyak, which is uh, durian fermented with chilies, and oh, which that's is that's du super delicious fermented durian sambal. Um, they also use uh, tempeh for sambal. So basically, it's right. sambal, everything can be made in a sambal way. It looks like so it's that, that ultimate condiment where they adding uh, whatever they have seasonal available. In, in certain location in Indonesia and then just make it a nice spicy condiment. Okay. Which you eat with the rice and the other dishes. Um, of course, then also the, the brim, what I already uh, talked about, the rice wine. And um, they also have something called tuak, which is like a fermented coconut nectar from the coconut tree. And so there's, yeah, there's also a lot of different ferments. But often when you talk to Indonesians, they don't really even have, call it a ferment. It's yeah. just like, so if you talk yeah. about ferment food, they usually look uh, at you with uh, uh, like unknowing eyes. Uh, what is he talking about? Yeah, but sure. They have a lot of uh, these, these um things in their, in their food cultures so all over the place, really. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess it's the same in Europe, but when we talk about cheese or wine, we don't really talk about ferments. It's just cheese and wine. Yeah. Some people, yeah, have to, like, they say, oh, yeah, right, this is actually fermented. So, yeah. yeah. My last question is about tempeh and black oncom. Um Tempeh, we all know. So there, my question would be, even though you live now in the perfect climate, um, to make tempeh, do you still face challenges when you make tempeh? And can you tell us more about black oncom? So yeah, black, black, uh, black oncom uses a certain different culture, um, but you can also make like oncom tempeh, which uh, just uses a normal tempeh culture. And usually it uh, used to be a way, as I understood, I mean, my, my uh, understanding is, of course, uh, also limited. Uh, it used to be a way to use leftovers. So okay. you have like a soybean pulp for making soy milk, or you have leftover peanut pulp for making uh, peanut oil, or mung bean pulp for making mung bean starch. So all of these, and in even coconut pulp um, uh, for making coconut milk, these items were mixed in with tempeh or used um, by themselves as a way to to make a tempeh from. And yeah. then um, some of them are a bit dangerous, like the one used with peanut and, and coconut because often they have aflatoxin, which is like a neurotoxin in them. Um, but the one using okara, the soybean pulp, um, is basically just the soybean pulp. You, you cook it and you dry it a little bit. And then usually it's pressed into a cake and then is uh, inoculated with this certain culture from the outside. Yeah. Uh, and then it's fermented like, like um, in a warm climate, um, like a tempeh, but the culture usually looks uh, red outside and, and on uh, the other one is black. So they have a yeah. red on black on uh, So that's, that's quite unique. But the interesting part really is that's uh, a way to utilize leftovers. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, so the, uh, and then for temperature, I still it's still not easy actually. I yeah. still have to. It's still cold, old, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I still have to keep the temperature stable for the yeah. first days. Um, so otherwise, it takes too long, and you don't get a nice uh, firm yeah. filament growing. So I usually keep it uh, warm for the first two days, like at 31, 32 degrees. Uh, it's easier when you have a hot, uh, warm season and the, in the dry season. But now in the wet season, it's quite difficult to make tempeh because it's okay. constantly, constantly weather is changing, yeah. warm, rain. Um, so, but yeah, I think it's... Um, the, 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 the good thing is here, you have a lot of uh, wild bacteria. So, like, I think the, the environment is very suitable for tempeh mm -hmm. because it's not too sterile like yeah. in Europe. Yeah. And actually, you have more B vitamins, more B12 also are found in Indonesian tempeh because the uh, environment is just so, uh, uh, how to say? It's so, still more, more diverse, I guess, than here. Yeah, more diverse. And, yeah. And um, you have a lot of wild cultures as well. And even yeah. the, the, the culture which you get here is often made, uh, is like a wild cultivated culture. Okay. Oh, that's that's really, a, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So they grow it on hibiscus leaves. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. I never thought about that. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. So yeah, this was it. Thanks so much. That was really, really interesting and very inspiring. Um, so where, where can our viewers learn more about your fermentation adventures? Where should they go? Yeah, so there's a local lab website. Um, so we post a lot of our experiments on the local lab, uh, not website, Instagram site. Yeah. And also on my personal site, um, Felix Schöner. I also post some of my uh, experiments on there as well. And that's pretty much it. Cool. So yeah, I'll link these accounts to the in the comments. And yeah, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. For was, your time. Uh, I enjoyed it. I hope uh, Yeah, we did you too. But you learned something and uh, it was not too technical. No, it was amazing. <laughs> really, really interesting.